Hello, my name is Muriel Sampson, and I am the Indigenous Counselor at St. Clair College. I would like to thank everyone for being here tonight. I would also like to thank Tutoring Services for moderating this evening's session. Igwech. Hello, hello. Um, Buju Anishna, Kayla Nindijnakaz, Bekejna Nindunjaba, Mijike Nindodam. And I am the Indigenous Learner Advisor at St. Clair College. We will begin with Muriel reading our land acknowledgement. St. Clair College would like to recognize and acknowledge that it sits on the Three Fires Confederacy, Confederacy's traditional territory of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. We would also like to acknowledge the many other tribes and indigenous nations that call this beautiful land home. We give thanks to the land and surrounding water for sustaining us. Treaties Recognition Week was introduced in 2016 to honor the importance of treaties and to help students and residents of Ontario learn more about treaty rights and treaty relationships. This year, Treaty Recognition Week is from November 1st to November 7th, 2020. I would like to welcome you to our treaty presentation tonight. Before we introduce our presenter for this evening, we would like to take a quick poll for the audience. On a scale from one to five, one being very knowledgeable and five being not very knowledgeable, how would you rate your current understanding and knowledge of treaties? All right. Thank you. I'd like to show the responses. Shot of that. At the moment, it would seem that this presentation is timely, as many of us are interested in knowing more. Dr. Dean Jacobs is the consultation manager for Wapool Island First Nation. He currently specializes in impacts and benefits agreement negotiations. For the past 47 years, he has been the driving force behind WIFN's internationally acclaimed community-based research program called Nindawabjig. He is a member of the University of Windsor's Board of Governors, in addition, Dean serves on the Advisory Council of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization and is an adjunct professor in the Interfaculty Program in Public Health, Schultz School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University. Dean is a former chief of WIFIN and the founding director of the Watpool Island Heritage Center. He is the recipient of two Eagle Feathers and three honorary doctorate degrees. And now a bit about the presentation. Dr. Jacobs will provide a guided journey on the treaty history of Wapool Island First Nation in tonight's presentation. Treaty Strong, Honoring Our Past and Walking Forward Together. Written historical records only tell part of the story and this holds true when only examining the text of treaties. Above all else, treaties are agreements. From written and oral histories, what do we know about what was actually agreed upon? What was the relationship between the Crown and First Nations during this period of tremendous change? How did the relationships progress afterwards? And how can we honor the intentions of these treaties today to bring about much needed reconciliation? These are some of the questions Dr. Jacobs will analyze along with examining what the path forward may look like. Welcome, Dr. Jacobs. Rich, Kayla, uh, Bajou, <clears throat> Dean Jacobs, Dishnakaz, Eswanan, Yunjaba, Awashkash, Dodam. My name is Dean Jacobs. I'm from Wapal Island First Nation, also known as Where the Waters Divide, Eswanan Territory and I'm of the Deer Clan. So as Kayla mentioned that uh, my presentation is titled Treaty Strong, Honoring Our Past and Walking Forward Together. So what, what I want to do tonight is um, tell as many stories as possible through this presentation, uh, backed up by some facts, but also, I think it's important that uh, by telling stories, you might remember the stories and, and not necessarily the every fact that I'll present through the presentation. 
I, I believe uh, stories are easier to remember than sometimes just the words. I'll be starting off with a 101 uh, on treaties, trying to get everyone on the same page, and then uh, I'll go into the uh, treaties that our ancestors from Wapawala participated and were signatories with the British Imperial Crown. I'm going to uh, read from the slides. Um, to get everybody on the same page. So that's our. Did that? Okay, so long before Europeans arrived, the Anishinaabe, also known as the Three Flyers, occupied a large territory, including parts of present day Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio. Game, fish, maple sugar, and other resources found in this territory are integral to their way of life and identity. The Anishinaabek defended their territory against attacks by Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois warriors in the 17th century. Territorial integrity was at the core when they finally made peace in Montreal in 1701. A key element of the 1701 treaty was the dish with one spoon. The dish represented the territory and the single spoon symbolized that people from other territories would be able to eat together while peace was maintained. Recently, however, the dish with one spoon has been revived, popularized as an agreement to protect the environment. The dish with one spoon treaty has been incorporated into land acknowledgement states, into land um, acknowledgement statements that blur the territorial rights of individual First Nations. This transformation of an important treaty is damaging to First Nations who seek to protect their treaties, their territories, and resources. Obama First Nation is working to reclaim their dish. I wanted to make that uh, statement right off the bat, and uh, I won't be going into this treaty because it's a treaty between uh, First Nations. I'm going to focus on the treaties with our ancestors and the Imperial Crown. But um, just very recently, th this week, um, an article that um, I wrote along with Dr. Victor Litwin got released from um, the Ontario History Journal. So if, um, if you want more about the dish with one spoon, you can go to that journal and read our article. Aboriginal rights are those rights of Aboriginal people which are based in the activities and customs of their ancestors. Canadian law recognizes as Aboriginal rights those activities which have some continuity with activities which were integral to the distinctive culture of an Aboriginal nation before the time of contact with European peoples. Some of the most common Aboriginal rights are rights to hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering, also known as harvesting rights. So I'm using Aboriginal in this presentation. I want to go back and forth from Indigenous to Aboriginal, but um, I'm using Aboriginal because it is in Canadian law. And this presentation isn't about, uh, um, it is about Canadian case law, but not uh, our own Aboriginal law. And that's a uh, uh, lecture by itself and um, it's, it's more than a lecture and it's more than a book but for tonight we're going to look at Aboriginal rights and treaties. So Aboriginal title is a particular Aboriginal right to prove Aboriginal title. A First Nation must show that its ancestors exclusively occupied the lands in question. The First Nation who establishes Aboriginal title has the exclusive right to use the land for a variety of purposes. That is, the First Nation may decide who is or is not permitted to use the land. However, in some circumstances, a court may permit some infringements of Aboriginal title if they can be justified. 
So I'm going to talk a, a bit later about Aboriginal title. It's really important to Wapawa Island First Nation. And hopefully you'll see in the presentation why it's so important to us, but it's important to all citizens of Canada. So a treaty generally is, form is, a, is formally concluded and ratified agreement between nations. Agreements between Aboriginal people and the Crown are considered a type of treaty. Treaty rights originate from these agreements. Treaties are solemn agreements made between nations and have been recognized in the Canadian Constitution. While treaties were also made with other First Nations, French and the United States, the ones with the British Crown are most important today because Canadian government derives its constitutional authority by virtue of its development from earlier British colonial government. So this, that's a really important statement. Uh, um, and I did mention that uh, First Nations have made treaties with other First Nations, French and the United States. But again, tonight, this is about the treaties with the British Imperial Crown and now Canada, of course. So what is significance about the historic uh, treaties? What is, what is significant? It's important to discuss for two main reasons. First, to build a better relationship with Aboriginal peoples requires that governments and citizens recognize that treaties with Aboriginal peoples are the foundation that allowed non-Aboriginal people to send Ontario enjoy and enjoy its bounty. Secondly, there exist outstanding legal obligations and promises from treaties made in the past. These treaties are not, as some people believe, relics of the past. They are living arrangements and understanding, understandings on which they are based continue to have force in Canada today. I remember one time uh, uh, a former chief from Walpole Island was talking to a local farmer in, in this area around uh, Walpole Island and the uh, chief uh, got into discussion with him about treaties and uh, our chief said well okay let's do away with the treaties and the, and the farmer was really surprised that uh, the chief would say to do away with the treaties and, it, and he asked why and the chief said well if there are no treaties then you don't have a leg to stand on that's your authority to uh, reside where you are. So that's important to understand that uh, our ancestors at Wapala Island opened up the settlement to non-Indigenous peoples. So the, the, it's important to look at the treaty process because it held out the promise of a relationship based on mutual respect and common interests. However, once the settler population came up to outnumber the Aboriginal population, the Indigenous nations were no longer needed as military allies to, to defend the colony. Respect for the treaties on the non-Aboriginal side gave way to policies of domination and assimilation. For over a century, governments, both federal and provincial, either ignored treaty obligations or interpreted them unilaterally while the Aboriginal signatories did not have access to political or legal means of addressing treaty claims. So just remember this thought later on because I'll talk about some of those obstacles that prevent prevented First Nations to um, seek uh, redress or um, to honor the treaties. There were many barriers put in, um, in front of uh, First Nations. Okay, so I talked about uh, our traditional territory. And this is a um, nice view of, of Walpole Island. It's located uh, right in the middle of our traditional territory. Um, I will, can we see that there? That's Walpole Island. Can somebody confirm that they see the arrow? If you could choose the second icon, the one with the little hand with the pointer, the arrow doesn't show up perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so here's Walpole Island. This is our traditional territory. I'm going only going to be talking about 
this part of our traditional territory. But from this slide, what's important, you can see uh, Windsor, Detroit, Walpole Island. Um, one of the things that really shows up here is that most of our territory at Walpole Island, our community, shows up a little different color because this view from uh, space shows the reflection of heat. So you're going to see a lot of heat from a pavement in uh, Detroit. And then in the rural areas, there's less of, uh, it's more green. So but it's important to uh, recognize that uh, Walpole Island is the, in the middle of the corridor of our traditional territory from Lake Huron to Lake Erie. So from the period uh, 1790 to 1827, this was uh, subsequent to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which um, the British um, Crown recognized uh, Indian territory. They uh, characterized it as the Indian hunting ground. And in order for any European or Imperial Crown occupation of their settlers, in our territory, the Royal Proclamation set up a system whereby there would be uh, treaties made between the Crown and the First Nations before settlement uh, could occur. So the first one occurred in this area in 1790. It shows up purple on this slide. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this one and then um, move on to uh, the treaty process and why it's important to honor our treaties. So that, this is, um, I think, uh, close to 5 million acres, um, give or take uh, some acres, but in one average human generation, our ancestors at Walpole Island shared our traditional territory with the British Imperial Crown. So we're the St. Clair College campus, uh, uh, both of them, the Chatham one, the Windsor, and I'm not sure if you have any more, but it is in our traditional territory, but it's also in this treaty that occurred on, um, in May of 1790. What's important to recognize here that um, our ancestors and the Imperial Crown, and I'm going to show the, I'm going to jump to the next slide and come back. This is a copy of that treaty of 1790. It was known as the McKee Purchase. He was the Indian agent, and it was signed in Detroit. So that gives you an idea of our traditional territory. This was before the international boundary between the United States and Canada. Our First Nation have these kinds of lines on our territory. We treated uh, both the what is now the United States and Canada as one unit. So this was signed in Detroit by the uh, chiefs of the Ottawa, uh, Chippewa and Potawatomi, and the Huron um, First Nations. Now, uh, as a supplemental reading, there is a respect uh, statement from the University of Windsor that we provided for their land acknowledgement statement, and that's available for knowing more about the, the history around this treaty and uh, our present uh, our presence still in the area. In fact, when this treaty was made, there were two tracts of land that were reserved for our ancestors. And, and as today, it's um, Anderdon Township. It was called the Huron Reserve, but it's basically Anderdon Township around Amherstburg. But there is also a, um, a smaller reserve set apart on Huron Church Road currently today. And that was um, supposed to be around 4,000 acres. But when it was surveyed after the treaty, um, our First Nation was shortchanged by 3,000 acres. So that's one of our uh, grievances today that um, we, we need to revisit this treaty to make sure that it was honored and moving forward today, we're looking to um, reclaim uh, those 3,000 acres through negotiations with Canada. 
So it's uh, we've submitted a, a specific claim around this treaty, both for the unconscionable con um, consideration. We, our ancestors received in 1790 1,200 pounds in currency, and a pound back then converted to about uh, four to one, like a one pound uh, equal four dollars. So when you do the math, uh, it was a million two hundred thousand acres. Do the math, and uh, you you you'll discover that uh, our ancestors received less than a penny an acre. So it's uh, not much when I say that because there really wasn't a market until there was a treaty for land sales. Shortly after 1790, settlers start started selling it amongst themselves and they were receiving from one to uh, two dollars an acre so quite a difference uh, from less than a penny an acre to uh, two dollars per acre so we want to revisit the the, um, the compensation it was a lump sum payment later on we have some treaties with the british imperial crown that changed from lump sum payments to annuities and I'll, I'll speak to one um, shortly in this presentation. <clears throat> What's important to um, recognize in this treaty, and by the way, this treaty, it's not a very good uh, rendition of this treaty, but it is, it is a, a picture photograph of the original one. The original treaty will be coming to the Windsor Museum in June 2021. So for the whole month of June there'll be a display of this treaty um, at the Windsor Museum. We hope to uh, celebrate that month and also have uh, more events besides the display at the museum but you'll be able to come and see this treaty. This is a map of the territory from, from present-day Windsor to present-day uh, London. So it's important to recognize here that the exterior boundaries of this treaty only went to the water's edge. Also, when you read the treaty, because gathering, uh, harvesting was integral to our way of life, to our ancestors' way of life, you have to imagine what they were sharing. They were sharing the territory to allow houses to be built in our territory. In fact, when you read the the text of the treaty, that's what it says that they agreed to allow houses to be built in our territory. So today you might interpret that to mean um, simply that. I, th I think other governments will interpret that to mean that that it's been sold and our rights have been extinguished and it, not only have we allowed houses to be built upon our territory, um, but the view of some of other other governments is that we extinguished our air rights, subservice rights, and um, but when you read the treaty, it's very clear that our harvesting rights were not extinguished. It was so integral to our way of life. Canadian courts have uh, ruled that where a treaty is silent on rights, and it, unless the First Nation explicitly agreed to extinguish those rights, those rights continue to exist. So that's the case here, 1790, hunting, fishing, gathering rights was not mentioned in this treaty, it was silent. So those rights continue to this day. Bubble Island First Nation holds those rights individually and collectively as a First Nation. So that means that um, today we can hunt, fish, gather anywhere in our traditional territory, um, but uh, we are trumped by certain, um, uh, we have the first right to do so for food and for ceremony, but if it's, say, for example, the last fish species or the last duck species, then we're trumped by conservation, and we understand that because we practice uh, sustainability at our First Nation. Uh, we're, we're, we're also trying safety. So if, um, if I said that I had the, hunt to, the right to hunt ducks on the Detroit River, well, it might not be safe. So uh, my rights would be Trump, but 
um, beyond that, uh, Waffle Island First Nation has rights to uh, continue their practices in our traditional territory. I'm going to go back to uh, this slide. So again, this um, uh, treaties from 1790 to 1827. I'm going to just uh, mention a couple. This treaty here, um, 1796, on the same day, the London Treaty and the Somber Township Treaty. Again, lump sum payments. Um, this treaty here in the interior, um, Walpole Island ancestors were not, not party to. Um, in 1827, 200, or 2,200,000 acres was surrendered to the British Imperial Crown uh, from Goderich to Sarnia and a large portion of the interior. Again, notice that these treaties only follow the water's edge. So at the same time from that period, 1790 to 1827, our ancestors also made treaties with the United States government. I don't have it on this map, but I can um, outline the exterior boundaries. In 1807, the Treaty of Detroit, our ancestors made a treaty that uh, started in present-day Ohio and went uh, past uh, uh, into Lake Huron, into the interior of Michigan. And uh, But the difference of that treaty, it went out to the international boundary line came down the boundary line in Lake Huron, went down the St. Clair River, half of the St. Clair River, half of Lake St. Clair, and half of the Detroit River, and then back to um, present-day Michigan. Hunting rights were actually reserved in that treaty. So we have differences of uh, treatment from U.S. government. It was important, both um, treaties and the United States and with the British Imperial Crown recognized the importance of, of uh, hunting and fishing in a different way by being silent here with, in um, southwestern Ontario. But the United, Gover United States government felt it was important to actually be explicit in the treaty and reserve it. Okay, um, I will point out the treaty in 1827. This is where the compensation changed from lump sum payments to annuities. Uh, and the annuities were calculated by doing a population of the First Nation that uh, occupied that territory and were signatories of that treaty. The population was determined in 1827 as 440 individuals, men, women, and children. The, um, the view at the time, I would say men mentality, was that um, it, $10 per person was enough for a year's uh, livelihood. So the treaty compensation was $4,400. But there was a clause in the treaty that said that in the case that the First Nation population would decrease, then the annuities would decrease proportionally. So that's why I said the mentality. So the mentality of the day was that First Nations were dying from disease, we were vanishing, we would no longer be around. So that's why that clause was incorporated in the treaty. But there was no foresight by the British Imperial Crown officials to have a clause of to increase the annuities. And today, the 440, today it's well over 10,000 citizens of our First Nations that were um, uh, party to that treaty, the ancestors and present day population. Well, let's do the math of, on that one. Um, two million two hundred thousand acres divided by the annuity of uh, four thousand four hundred. So I've done the math quickly um, in my head uh, because this treaty was um, 
we had the more than one First Nation community. We had the Amsterdam community at Sarnia. We had the Kettle Point and Stony Point community First Nations of Lake Huron and the Walpole Island First Nation were the parties to this treaty. So today, um, our share at Walpole Island um, is $150 a month. That's what we get for 2,200,000 acres, $150 a month rental. I would uh, uh, ask you, is that fair? But I would ask you not to answer that question, and I won't answer that question either. I'll just uh, put that out there, because what our First Nation is doing is saying, we don't think it's fair, so we're going through the process either through courts or filing it as a specific claim under Canada's specific claims policy and to try to negotiate a fair settlement and a just settlement today. So just to let you know that the Canadian case law and the policy of the federal government that um, it's not to return lands that were stolen from us. Um, it, we, we don't want to have another claim or injustice that uh, taking lands away from innocent third parties that are living in our territory. So negotiations are around uh, uh, compensation monetary. So the idea would be to settle claims and then uh, purchase lands on the open market and return it to, to uh, uh, reserve status or uh, under the control of our First Nations. So that's um, a quick history of our territory and our treaties. I want to go to the next slide because I mentioned that the Aboriginal title is important to us at Walpole Island First Nation. Everything in red on this map are lands that haven't been covered by treaties that were, uh, were signed by the ancestors of the Walpole Island First Nation or present uh, ancestors or members of our First Nation. That's a, a big chunk of southwestern Ontario. So there's no treaty for the bed of Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie, half of the Detroit River, half Lake Huron. Remember I mentioned that our ancestors made a treaty with the United States government in 1807 for half of the Lake Huron. So the, the United States government recognized that our First Nation were property owners of the beds of the Great Lakes. So we're now um, uh, putting forward that uh, grievance with Canada saying that there you don't have permission because you don't have a treaty for half of Lake Huron, half of Lake St. Clair, half the St. Clair River, half of Detroit, and half of Lake Erie. And also the treaty number 25 in the interior of our traditional territory, the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation were signatories to that treaty. Walpole Island, Omdenon, Kettle Point, Caldwell First Nation were not signatories to that. So we, we claim an Aboriginal title. In fact, we um, advanced that claim over a four decades ago eventually got to a point where we got it had an agreement with Canada and Ontario to try to negotiate the, the boundaries of Walpole Island First Nation because if you ever come to our First Nation you'll see that uh, on our water tower it says unseated. Well Walpole Island has never been um, covered by a treaty, it's never been surrendered, it's pure Aboriginal title, unceded traditional territory. Having said that, there is no boundaries uh, for the reserve. It's been treated as a reserve, so we had got into many, many, many conflicts with other governments over exercising our traditional rights, our inherent rights, uh, dragged into court, and we finally um, were able to um, get a table with Canada and Ontario to negotiate the boundaries of the Walpole First Nation Reserve. Those negotiations broke down in 1998. Our First Nation decided to then take the issue to court. Our First Nation filed a statement of claim April 2000, 
in, uh, in Canadian court. 20 years later, we're still years, years away from trial. It takes a long, long time to resolve outstanding land claims. So what we're seeking there is just a recognition that there's no treaty. That's all we're asking Canada and Ontario to say, this, look at this area, our Aboriginal title. Again, what does Aboriginal title mean? It means that it's a property right. So this is more a property issue. It raises the, the level of our involvement as a First Nation, as a property owner. It's not at the level of jurisdiction where no court in Canada has dealt with jurisdiction at this level. But they have the Supreme Court of Canada, as you may know, have ruled on Aboriginal title in British Columbia. Very similar to our case here, no treaties in British Columbia. And we're saying there's no treaty here with our First Nation. Also, the San Nation, that's the Nawash and Saugeen First Nation, they also are claiming just north of us the, the rest of Lake Huron, portions of Georgian Bay. And they got ahead of us in, in their court case, in their court case. So we decided to put our uh, case in abeyance and let them uh, finish theirs. And they finished it actually last week. So the after over a year in the court, um, it has now gone to the judge for a decision. So um, keep your uh, eyes and ears open for that decision next year. And that'll open the door for us to also go back to court. In the meantime, um, we're trying to negotiate a settlement um, because it's, it is expensive and it takes a long time. Okay, um, I'm going to get move, moving on. So fast forward oh, from the 1790s, 18, early 1800s. I'm going to fast forward to uh, the 1960s. But let me mention first that uh, when I said that there were barriers for us as uh, First Nations to to um, seek resolution of outstanding land claims, well, it was against the Canadian law for for um, Indians to advance uh, their claims. We couldn't hire lawyers according to federal law until 1951. In fact, when I was born, according to federal legislation, I was not considered a individual. Think about that. What was I then? Federal legislation uh, considered me as an Indian. And because the federal government assumed jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved to Indians, they also then decided who was an Indian and what we could do and couldn't do. In 1951, uh, the Indian Act was changed, and I became a person. You know, I was pretty young. I didn't uh, know about that. Uh, I know the history now, and I understand that was one of the barriers and ways of keeping us down. We uh, have come a long way from not being a, um, a person to becoming a person in 1951. Um, in 1960, the uh, Diffie Baker government um, uh, granted uh, Indians the right to vote federally in 1960. So while we had this all this federal le legislation for 100 years telling us who we are, what we can do and couldn't do, we couldn't vote the members of parliament in or out because we weren't considered, considered citizens and didn't have the federal vote until 1960. So I say that was actually not granted to us, it was offered to us. So a lot of First Nation citizens have not taken up citizenship because they're worried about uh, violating their own citizen codes with First Nations. Personally, I have taken up uh, Canadian citizenship because I want to have a say. But uh, since we had the uh, Indian Act for 100 years, in 1965, our chief and council decided they had enough of this uh, colonial rule. And the, uh, the symbol was the Indian agent that was parachuted into every First Nation community across the country um, 
administrating the Indian Act, we had enough and the chief and council kicked out the Indian Age in 1965. We were the first in Canada, first First Nation to do so. It was characterized back in 1965 as the, um, the an experiment on self-government. As we know in hindsight, we don't have pure self-government or self-determination today. It was an experiment on self-administration, but it, we've come a long way since. And all of a sudden, the, the uh, liberal government of the day in 1969 wanted to uh, solve the problem, uh, the so-called Indian problem. They were going to do away with uh, Indian status, do away with Indian reserves. It was called the white paper policy in 1969. The idea would be within five years, we would no longer exist as reserves or Indian people. We would be assimilated into the main street. Well, of course, uh, that didn't happen. Um, we galvanized, galvanized the First Nations across the country. We got the support from the white uh, liberal press, and we got the federal government to shelve this policy. Within 13 short years, instead of being wiped off the face of uh, Mother Earth, uh, we turned the politics of Canada upside down. Instead of uh, being wiped out, we vaulted to the su Supreme Law of Canada and the Constitution Act of 1982, Section 35, the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal people of Canada are recognized and affirmed in the Constitution of Canada. Wow, in, in my lifetime, I've become a person, I've been able to vote federally, and now I'm, in the, I'm protected in the Supreme Law of Canada. So we say, so what? Because we're not there yet. Okay, so I'm going quickly through this. I, I'm looking at the time. So this is um, the, the statement. The statement of political relationship in 1991. You may not remember that, uh, but Bob Ray uh, got it right. He uh, signed a political relationship statement with the Peace of Ontario and recognized them as distinct nations with cultures, languages, traditions, customs, and territories. Boy, the um, Bay Street the next day thought um, Bob Ray was giving the province away to the Indians. I don't know if you can remember what happened the next day as well. Well, the sun came up. The earth kept uh, burning. So just another st statement. He had it right, but didn't have the goodwill and the political will to um, actually do anything with that statement. Then we had uh, the Ipawash incident in 1995. It took 10 years to get a inquiry, and uh, one of the recommendations was to emphasize the um, and educate citizens of Ontario about the um, treaty relationships. Well, that's good, and what we're trying to do that tonight then you talk about reconciliation. Well, the Minister of Indian Affairs in 1998, this is, today is not the first time you've heard about reconciliation. She made a statement of reconciliation in 1998. Uh, you can see this for yourself. This is Jane Stewart when she was the Minister of Indian Affairs. A lot of recognition. In fact, the Prime Minister in 2008, and I remember this day, I knew exactly where I was when I heard this apology. This is respecting the um, the residential schools. Um, Stephen Harper said, the government of Canada sincerely apologized and asked the forgiveness of the Aboriginal peoples of this country for failing them so profoundly. We are sorry. I remember that day. But guess what? Next year, he said this at a summit in Pittsburgh. He said, we Canada also have no history of colonialism. Lots of contradictions. And we've got another commission, commission after commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They got it right as well. Their main focus was trying to implement the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We're still waiting. The commissioner of the inquiry of uh, Ipawash, he is quoted 
as qu uh, quoting Chief Justice Lamer in the Dalgamo case in British Columbia, where the judge, Chief Justice, uh, said, "Let's let us face this. We face it. We are all here to stay. My hope is that not only will we face this reality, we will embrace it in the original spirit and the intent of the treaties." Lots of good words, but it, we've got to action it. Well, I want to introduce you to the, our community a little bit. This is a view looking um, south. This is the tip of Walpole Island. This would be Windsor over here, across the lake, and Detroit over here. On a clear day, I can go down to the beaches here on Walpole Island, look across the lake, and I can see the skyscrapers of Detroit. Three things to know about Wapalaya First Nations. You don't need to know a lot, but this is, will be a, a first step. We're located under the intersection of two continental migratory bird flyways, Mississippi and Alaska. That's important to us. We're home of over 70 species at risk. We're a biodiversity gem, but we're under threat. We're located. Uh, um, south uh, on the St. Clair River of Chemical Valley in Sarnia, and the St. Clair River uh, has been designated as one of the four, 42 areas of concern that are contaminating the Great Lakes. I try to look at our community uh, from our community perspective, but also from a traditional territory perspective. So we look at our community as ecosystems, and then we try to um, look at our territory in terms of units and ecosystems. On Walpole Island, we have five ecosystems, coastal waters, wetlands, tall grass prairies, oak savannas, and forests. We look at uh, development in our traditional territory. We like to see the conversation shift away from impact avoidance, the risk management, mitigation, justified infringement. We want to see more collaboration and partnership. That means sustainable development, community well-being, equity participation, and resources revenue sharing in our traditional territory. It all stems from our pre-confederation treaties. We do have specific claims, as I mentioned. so. We have uh, some successes and we're getting some benefit from those land claims and they'll continue in the future. We, our chiefs of um, the, the First Nations in Ontario made a deal with the Ontario Lottery, uh, OLG, Gaming Corpor Corporation. We now get 1.7% of all the gaming in Ontario. So we're starting to build some wealth. Um, the Green Energy Act, not too long ago, uh, created some opportunities for First Nations. I'll talk a bit about that. Um, we do have wind farms now. Uh, the Duty to Consult has created some opportunities for hosting agreements of development projects in our territory. Hydro One sharing offer. Um, 130 First Nations were able to um, purchase over 15 million shares of Hydro One. So we are now um, one of the owners of Hydro One with that share offering. So these are small steps. I call it the creep. We also uh, want to collaborate not just with others, but also with First Nations. We've got to do more of this. So we've done so. We've got a declaration for a overlap in Lake Huron, the five First Nations declaration. We've got a um, Agreement for Point Point Pelee National Park with the collaboration with Caldwell First Nation. Shipman case, we got a court decision uh, saying that our First Nation members can shelter under other First Nation treaties. That's important uh, amongst First Nations. And the Grand Bend Wind, that's a 100 megawatt wind farm, Walpole Island and um, Amtanong First Nation, we're the ma ma um, majority equity owners in a 100 megawatt wind farm. Huge. More recently, we've also were able to partner with other partners for Bell River Wind and North Kent Wind. A total of 300 megawatt uh, 
in those three wind farms, we have equity interest in those three. To give you an idea of the size of investment, not just uh, alone our investment from our First Nation, but of all our partners, when you combine all the investments with our um, in that, those three projects, it goes over a billion Canadian dollars. So we've invested in the Canadian Ontario economy over a billion dollars just in those three wind farms. Our return on investment, you know, it's going to be over a billion. You know where that's all going. We're going to go and um, invest that back in our traditional territory. So the point here is that the better off we are, the better off everybody else will be. We're helping to build the economy as well. Okay, I want to finish with uh, um, a case study, the uh, Detroit River International Crossing. It's now known as the Gordy Howe International Bridge, but it had three components, the parkway, the plaza for the customs, and the bridge itself. It was a huge undertaking, undertaking once, um, once in a generation undertaking. About 11 kilometers for the parkway that's now completed. We were heavily involved in it. And you remember this slide? This is the 1790 treaty. Those are signatories of our First Nation, and they're painted in our clan dotums. So, in our partnership with the Herb Gray Parkway, we were able to um, look at the overpasses and the parkway. There's seven overpasses, pedestrian overpasses, and the light went on saying, well, we can do something with that because we told them the, about our seven grand, grandfather teachings. So we were able to uh, get some opportunities to put our clan dotums of our ancestors on the pedestals of the parkway of the pedestrian overpasses. That's happening right now. It's seen but not seen. <clears throat> I'm not sure how many of you have walked those um, uh, pedestrian overpasses and the trails. Uh, we tell the story of uh, the grandfather stone at a sculpture at one of the sites. Whoa, that should be turned the other way. Sorry about that. That's uh, that's site one, that's a major site. And we celebrated the opening in 2016. So in conclusion, there are lots of opportunities in developing new partnerships in Canada and US and beyond, utilizing global markets, the law, legislation, policy statements to advance and promote reconciliation and First Nation well-being. And moving from the recognition of Aboriginal law, our own law, and our traditional knowledge to having it respected and valued. So what are the future imperatives? Well, it's to seek and build new partnerships, opportunities when it proves to be useful for the well-being and betterment of the Wobble Island First Nation community. But as I said, you're all part of our community. We're walking together forward. We also have to maintain, strengthen, and su sustain existing relationships to implement and realize opportunities within, within our territory. Continue to support advocacy efforts of our First Nation government in advancing measures to preserve, manage, and develop our territory and promote reconciliation. We're all part of it, and I welcome you to walk with us. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. I was so enthralled with your um, presentation, I forgot to type in the poll question. So if you give me just a moment, I will make that poll question ready. Um, and I want folks to be thinking about if you've got a question that you would like to ask. Um, we will be moving into the uh, question and answer section. You have a opportunities you can come on mic and ask your question directly by raising your hand you're also welcome
to put a question in the chat room if you would prefer not to um, come on to mic. So if you give me just a moment, and then I use my notes to take more notes. Maybe while I'm doing this, uh, Dr. Jacobs, you wouldn't mind um, a question. I think from um, for for many of us, and my parents immigrated to Canada in the 1950s, so I would consider myself a settler on this land. And I think um, my education through public school was not very complete, and it seemed to uh, from my experience, treat all indigenous people as one. So f I know that that uh, in uh, Canadian Constitute re Constitution recognizes First Nation, Métis, and Inuit, but still, I think of the way it was presented to me as a, a child in the education system, this was really one people. Could you just very briefly um, correct me, because I know that's incorrect. I know First Nation, it does not mean just one group of people. Okay, maybe I can do it with, uh, it's just coming to my mind, because what's going on in the east coast of Canada with uh, the Mi'kmaq uh, First Nation and their commercial fishing operations. So we had a um, junior C hockey uh, team in Chatham. And they decided to uh, change from their name from the Mar Maroons to the Micmacs. So when I heard that, um, I had an issue with that because they're not, they don't call themselves Micmacs, it's Micmog. And why um, honor a First Nation that's not a traditional territory in Chatham? So I did call the president of the club and uh, did some education and he said well they're a small club uh, he understood that uh, it's wrong but he couldn't do anything about it i wasn't satisfied with that uh, answer so um, you know, i really demanded that he take down that logo because he had a screaming indian on mm -hmm. the, on the on the t-shirt so it was um you know stereotypical mm -hmm. Um, and everything else is wrong, wrong, wrong. So um, I said, well, if, if, if you're not going to do anything, I'm going to seek the support of the, the Chatham community. And I have lots of friends in the Chatham community. So they, they suggested that uh, they would support me uh, if I called a economic boycott of um, Chatham and all the uh, merchants, the stores, and and so I did that. I announced that the Wapalan First Nation would boycott all the stores in Chatham. So, you know, when I talked about our billion dollar investment, well, we've been uh, investing uh, money in the surrounding territories. Our government alone at Wapal Island has so close to a $40 million budget. So where does all that go? We don't have a lot of places to spend that money in our community. So it goes to Ballsburg, Windsor, Chatham. So we really are part of those communities as well. We invest in them. So when I announced the boycott, the next day, uh, the president of the club capitulated. So oh. he, did, he did take uh, the change the jerseys and uh, I went back to the Maroons, I think. So, but um, he invited me to the opening day game and we shook hands and. We had a. Uh, I watched a good hockey game. Well, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so I've I've okay. added the question now. Has your understanding of treaties improved with this presentation? Uh, on a scale from one to five, with one being much improved and five being not improved, um, I ask you to uh, join us in a response. I'm going to give it just another moment or so just for for people. If you're looking for the uh, poll and you can't see it on your screen, if you look at the bottom of the main screen, beside where you have the uh, raise your hand, there is a poll. You can click on that and add your response. So I'd like to show the responses now. I'm seeing uh, uh, self-reporting of increased understanding 
um, although I am sure we would all love to be able to learn more from you, uh, Dr. Jacobs. So I'm going to ask folks if, um, if there are questions. I'm going to ask Marco if he can take a screenshot of this. Um, could I ask you, let's, let's end the presentation right now and um, ask if there are any questions. If you'd like to ask a question uh, on mic, please raise your hand. Um, oh, I do have a question in the chat room here. Um, when, you, when discussing community partnerships, what would you like to see from the tourism industry to culturally benefit or financially support our local First Nation communities? So from a, some of our students are in the travel and tourism programs, hospitality, et cetera. Um, what would you like to see from the point of view of the tourism industry? So just uh, speaking about the Windsor area, so we have uh, high presence in the area. We still have a land base. We have a reserve of 61 acres. I mentioned that we have presence on the pedestrian uh, bridges on the Herb Gray Parkway, and we have at the University of Windsor the uh, Turtle uh, Island Walk, and much of um, uh, the seven grandfather teachings are represented at both the parkway and the, the walk at the University of Windsor. Um, just a heads up, the Gordie Howe Bridge is under construction, and watch for the clan dotums and uh, um, indigenous art to go up uh, on a temporary basis there. So what I like to do is try to, because those are gateways to Canada. So I think we can work together to uh, promote tourism because I know that there's a lot of interest in our culture and it's not just our powwows, it's learning more about who we are and partnering with us in business um, and doing things together. So I think I'd like to connect the dots in Windsor, that our presence isn't just here at Walpole Island. It's our, um, we have communities in our traditional territory from Port Stanley to Outerick. So to try to connect, connect the dots and reach out in a good way to First Nation communities because we all will benefit with proper tourism. Thank you so much, that's wonderful. Thank you. That was Hannah who typed in the question. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions? One of the things I appreciated about your presentation was, was at the beginning when you highlighted the idea that treaties are the foundation that allowed settlers to come in and to live on this land. Um, I have heard in the past this idea that we are all treaty people wanted to know if you would, would comment on that idea that we are all treaty people. If that's something you agree with or? Yeah, treaties are um, not one-sided. Um, so we all are part of that treaty. So it's the same thing, trying to connect those dots from 1790 to present day. They're living documents. So that's it's, you got to read beyond the, the letter of the treaty and the spirit and the intent from an interpretation of a First Nation ancestor. So again, we wouldn't be cutting our throats and giving up our way of life, our livelihood, our territory. We were uh, offering to share our territory, but just like the dish with one spoon, there's obligations when we do share our territory. There's responsibility to be good stewards and have good development, but also we're saying today that the, the development has, has occurred without First Nation involvement, so we're now creeping forward and having some equity in the development our in our traditional territory. So um, to try to connect the dots, and also I tried to emphasize that you have to contextualize the treaties with the land. It's not just the treaties, it's in, not just these statements of land acknowledgement. Contextualize the community, the land, and the people. Excellent, thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Marco, would you like to come on mic and ask a question? 
Yes, rather than a question, uh, Dr. Jacobs, I would like to thank you on behalf of the attendees. And I'd also like to say that it was so very encouraging, so very positive to know that uh, First Nation involvement in the green energy projects, a chance for good to be done for the environment and a chance for wealth to be shared amongst those who have been denied for quite some period of time. Yeah, and it's a good point because, you know, part of that was when Ontario decided to um, shutter the coal-fired plants and replace them with clean energy. So we we are part of that. But what has happened, the result is that it's better air for everyone. You know, the asthma, those kinds of um, diseases have gone down. It's small days have gone down. So we don't take full credit, but you know, these are good things. Okay, I have a question for the room. Would, in, if you could answer in the chat room, if we had an opportunity to invite Dr. Jacobs back to talk to us more about this topic and others, would you be interested in learning more and having more workshops? Please add your comments in the chat room. I'm seeing lots of yeses. I don't want to put you on the spot. But no, I, I, I appreciate that because I have difficulty doing this virtually. I have better uh, conversation. And, and that's really, uh, I hope people saw that I was talking about relationships. And so with tourism, it's a relationship. It starts with relationships. And, and it can, it's difficult to get a virtual relationship. So... Uh, communities and municipalities need to develop relationships, chiefs, uh, mayors, uh, individuals. Uh, uh, we just have to continue on relationship building as we walk forward together. I agree. And, and I hope that there will be time in the future where we can meet in person and have some of those more personal discussions. But uh, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here uh, for coming to this webinar and for meeting with us virtually, I have to say you are a natural. I would have not guessed that this was not something that you didn't do every day. So thank you very much. A wonderful presentation. Uh, and also thank you to everyone who is here tonight and to Kayla and to Muriel for all of their hard work to put this together. Um, I, I really encourage you, Mur uh, Muriel and Kayla, continue this work with our our community and to offer us more education because my feeling from the people in the room in the chat room is that we're hungry for more information and for more knowledge. Uh, I want to uh, encourage everyone to have a safe and a healthy evening. Um, we want to wish you a good night and once again thank you for being here.